This month's Perf Talk is brought to you by the Guitar Friends. What would be your top five or so tips or advice for uh, musicians who want to start composing but don't know where to start? Uh, don't listen to whatever genre you're in anymore. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, that sounds like so, you know, authoritarian, but in the sense that, you know, if you want to write classical, say, if, if, for example, if you're a classical guitarist and you want to write music that's kind of modern classical music or whatever you want to write, don't keep, you know keep listening to Soar and Giuliani and anything that you know they're putting records you know all the the the, ca the cast of Usual Suspects that are out there making records of all the same tired stuff. I mean Bach of course is the you know the best. Keep listening to Bach of course or in, in any Baroque or Renaissance music. But like the 19th century stuff, give it a miss. There's some great stuff. I think Fernando Soar is a great composer. Giuliani is very, very good too. But even though Soar is I think brilliant. There's a lot of really B quality and C quality music that people keep playing again and again. So expand out of that. Go to some of the masterworks and master composers throughout history from the medieval periods up through the modern realm. And not don't listen to stuff just because people tell you it's good because a lot of times they have no idea. Follow your, your own instincts and heart. If the music fascinates you, that's a sign that maybe you should understand it better and listen to it. If people tell you it's good, or it's just like the belief that it is, and you hear it again and again, but you're not into it. That's a sign that's not as good as people say it is. There is, there's no truth in this industry, you know, or in people's understanding. There's you know, a lot of mis misconceptions. So, you know, follow the things that you find are interesting and beautiful and fascinating, but expand, listen to everything. If you don't listen to everything, how are you going to compose in an authentic way? If you don't, if you can't have an internal understanding of how medieval music is structured and Renaissance music and Baroque music and, and you know, classical music and, and, you know, impressionistic music. And, you know, you have a sense of what those sound like and how the composers dealt with it, then you're not terribly literate. And there's nothing wrong with relying on your talent, you know, and just seeing where that goes. But I mean, if you, if you really want to start composing, feed yourself, listen to music, get inspiration, find music that you like, get out of your little, you know, you know, circle that you're in, whatever that may be, expand it, expand it and expand it some more. That's, that's the best advice for, you know, feeding the ears and the mind. Otherwise there's nothing inside to come back out, to percolate back out. My God, I don't want to hear like, you know, you know, Giuliani being rehashed and coming back out. I mean, not to knock Giuliani, but like really, what's the point? That's a very, you know, the problem with 19th century music, it was such a formulaic time. It's, there's some, some good music there, but it's my least favorite period, I think. Um, it's like, it's completely formulaic, like the way the, uh, the cadences are, the, 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 the modulations. I mean, you can almost hear the first few measures and you pretty know much exactly what's going to happen. And if not exactly, pretty close. They're going to depart here, they're going to do this, you know. Yeah, I just, and so why would you want to repeat that? You know, you got to go farther. Listen to medieval music. It sounds so fresh because it's so different than what we're used to and so much more complex than 19th century music, interestingly, I find. I, I find 19th century music that some of the simplest music. It's like all the complexity of Baroque began to dissolve and then you know, this modulation and intense counterpoint <coughs> dropped away. Now we use shorter counterpoint. We don't modulate so much. Now we we stay in keys and became classical and became this profound epic stuff. You know Haydn, I mean, you know Beethoven and all this wonderful stuff and some great composers, Mahler and all these things. And then let's simplify it some more. Now let's make the cadences even more stylized. Now let's limit it even more where we don't now modulate hardly at all. We do it just goes for a moment, comes back. Now counterpoint is mostly disappeared, like little a little bit here. It's like. There's been a frittering away of some of the real depth and complexity. And many people disagree with the way I'm saying it, but this is the way it seems to me. But then again, I'm deeply attracted to counterpoint and multiple things going at once, which interests my mind, you know, so. You're right, because like 19th century music for me became like a accompaniment and lead. 
you know, instead of something that's yeah. that's uh, intrinsic, something yep. that's uh, interwoven. Yeah, I mean, nothing wrong with an art song. They're not counterpoint, like you know, Schubert or something like that. You hear these; they're beautiful, but they're crafted for something else. They're, they are a song with lyrics and accompaniment that's often quite beautiful on the piano. Um, but you know, that's just that is a style, a thing. But like when all music kind of goes that direction, the instrumental music too. I was, you know, somewhat disappointed to hear that happen, you know, historically. But things change. It's funny, though, how, you know, sometimes things become less complex and less rich. But, you know, a lot of people don't really have the capacity to really process sufficiently to get inside music that's more complex. They would rather have it dumbed down because it's easier. Players included. And you know, I, I, I you know, that's why I'm a maverick on the outskirts of the classical guitar world because I'm in a different different place, man. And, you know, the the way I look at things. That's why I don't care what anybody thinks because, you know, I just I, I can't because I you know, I'm I'm on a path that that's my own, you know. It's not like, you know, derivative of anybody else's and I'm not trying to fit in anywhere. I'm just trying to make music, you know, real music. Yeah, that's 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 so inspiring. <laughs> that, that that really is inspiring. Not just for music, it's actually inspiring on so many levels. You know, cuz like kids nowadays who don't know what to do or where to go is have to find that one thing that you that you really like to share and and just put it out there and just, you know, just just let it out without without thinking about you know how it would be received and 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 all that because it's 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 very it's very difficult i don't know there's always that teenager in us that that's always seeks for approval i guess You're right. and it, it takes a very strong personality to say that ah i'm gonna do this no matter what anybody says because i believe in it you're, you're right and i can't say it was always easy i certainly had periods where i did care and I got pissed off when I get a bad review or something, you know, I fume about it. And, and so, and also I ha I can look back on some success. You know, I've had a lot of my music become popular and I don't have to contend with nonsense anymore. But yes, when you're kind of up and coming and just trying out there, of course, you're much more, sen you're like a much more sensitive. You're a little bit raw because if you're putting your soul out there and some trolls start, t you know, typing crap about it, that... That, that can hurt, but you got to fight that stuff. You can't let them influence you. And that's, that is very hard. You have it, but the longer you stay on your own path and if it, you know, you're true to what you want to do and that can evolve, you know, <clears throat> you're going to have more and more self-confidence as time goes on. It's not a path for everyone. Some people don't really have that intensity or intense need to create something. You know, I just, I'm just filled with it. Music is in me all the time. I pick up the guitar, you know, that's, you know, all musicians love music. You know, most guitarists love guitar, you know, they're just so into it. So we all know what that means. You know, for me, it's beyond guitar. It's just about music. And the guitar is just the way I express it. I love the instrument, you know, it's a perfect instrument for me. But, um, no, though I wish uh, we could sustain notes, you know, like with, like with a, what you can do with a bow, you know, oh. We can't, we can't crescendo a note, you know, it's too bad. Wish you could. But, you know, every, like we said earlier, every instrument has limitations and you learn to deal with them. Hi there, Perf the Caster here, and I hope you're enjoying this episode of Perf Talk. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, like, and hit that subscribe button if you haven't yet. Ring that bell. This is just a quick break from the discussion so that I can take care of a few announcements. First up, Perf Talk is now a podcast and it's available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you want to download the full episodes, you can go to my website, perfectodecastro.com and click on the Perf Talk tab. And while you're at my website, I invite you to join and subscribe to my members only area. It's kind of like Patreon, but it's Perftreon. For only $15 a month, you can download all the digital goods on my web store from the video lessons to the song and album mp3s to the pdf tabs and guitar profiles you'll also get into the members only area where i host exclusive perftion only perks like advanced viewing of all my upcoming videos more downloadable pdfs and lessons my entire backing track library 
and music releases that are not available to the public. Of course, your name will be included in the list of Perfcreons featured in all of my videos. And as Perfcreon grows, all the membership perks that I offer will grow as well. As of this video, here is the list of current Perfcreons. Thank you, thank you so much for your support. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you who already bought their own Practice Mix Perfecto shirts and merch like this mug and this hoodie. Sales from these shirts and merch helps me keep making these videos for everybody to enjoy. And when you get your stuff, don't forget to send me a photo either through my Facebook page or Instagram account. That way I can feature you in future videos as I have done with my friends right here. Okay, now let's get back to Perf Talk. Well, you know, sometimes that's an interesting point because sustain is something that is almost a requirement by every guitar player for from their instruments. But like in, uh, I know in the electric world, not, now that you get sustain, a lot of people don't really know what to do with it. <laughs> yeah, the electric, you can do it. You can really have as much as you want. It's difficult to swell unless you use a pedal or something like that. But, but you can, I mean, I, I love playing electric especially distorted sometimes because what you could do is more violin-like in a way. You know, you have that capability. <laughs> but, I mean, you can make a mess with it too, but you, you, it's another avenue. I mean, that's amazing thing about guitar. It can do so many things that are that seem almost unrelated. Wow, you plug it in and distort it, it does this. That doesn't sound like a classical guitar. It's like amazing. It's so different. Or what things you can do in a steel string. Incredible instrument. Or what you do in a, you know, your multi-string, doing all the Baroque music and the stuff that you do and um yeah. are, are you a gearhead do you enjoy um, gear I, I i yes and no i mean i'm very technical you know i you, you probably know i like to you know i write software and stuff like that so and i like mathematics so i'm very technical and i like good gear you know i like you know i have my boom mic here that or am i um what's, what's the word the shotgun mic here for recording, we have all the lights, things for video, and you know, I've got my Zoom H6n here, and I just love stuff like that. Um, but I don't use it much. I don't play electric much anymore, you know. So I don't have I, that kind of avenue of gear that I did in high school and stuff when I was crazy for gear. <coughs> Not so much. It's, to me, they're only tools now, and I like really good tools. What about you? So, what do you? What, where are you coming from with that? Oh uh, no, because like guitar players also, aside from the music, they're they're also uh, interested in in the instruments, you know, because like everybody's looking for a magic instrument that'll m magically make them sound better or make them play better or make them play differently, and <laughs> it's also it's not... like looking for the you know you know the the well of immortality yeah. there's, and it's there's no such thing you just find a guitar you like and you, you're responsible for making the sounds on it yeah right? it's not unheard of to sit, to to blame the instrument too if you're not able to to do something <laughs> yeah that's a cop out <laughs> yeah I mean of course you know, li instrument can limit you but I mean a, I do one thing and I'll let you finish that thought like Art Tatum the incredible jazz pianist you know he's blind he was just I mean technique he actually liked when he would sit down to a piano that had a broken key because it forced him to like the challenge of figuring out how to do everything around a piano that was missing a note. He wasn't blaming the piano. He was like, cool, a challenge. So I'm not saying we want to screw up our guitar so to make it, you know, challenging, but, but I mean, it, it is a cop out. Yeah. You pick up a cheap guitar and the six string buzzes. Yeah. So you're not going to be playing the Chacon really well, but, you can do other things, and if, if you're, like, especially if you improvise, and you go, well, I'll just have to adjust myself. You know, not that you want to play on that guitar all the time, but, you know, it, there be, there is kind of a cop-out element. Of course, we want the best instrument that represents us, but you can't blame your tone on the instrument. That's crap. Your tone is what you make. Yes. <laughs> so, what do you look for in an instrument? I mean, what, what qualities do your instruments have that made them keepers for you? Oh, I look for magic instruments that make me sound great. No, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I don't know at this point. I, I when I, you know, back in the day, I used to go and just play. You go to a festival and there's all these guitars and you play them, right? <clears throat> Maybe you got five guitars here. And what I would first do is pick them up and play a little bit on each one. Then I would notice which ones my body would put down. Like I tried not to think too much. I would just play and feel. And I noticed then suddenly, like, before conscious thought even, I'd put one guitar down. 
And I, and I kept putting that one down quickly. And then I would rule that one out. Okay, something, something in my body didn't like it. And then I could analyze it. Well, it's just that the action's too high and it's unpleasant to play. But often if I thought of it, was, no, it's something about the way it responds. It's not perfect for me. And then there'd be one or two of those guitars that I kept keeping in my hands. I just kept playing them. And I think, okay. So then I'd pay attention to those. Why do I like these? And then I'd, you know, you know, experiment with them, check, do all the range stuff, and, and just get to know them a bit and, and just see how it felt to play them, you know, different styles. And I would make, I would make it in a very non-intellectual way. I didn't, like, you know, get out and, like, calipers and measure the distances and you know, I, of course I did all that I looked and you know checked it. it's got to be comfortable but it's totally how it felt as a musical instrument ah that mic is in my beard that was weird um has it been there all the time yeah <laughs> a little, little windscreen <laughs> so um and you know it's just got to be of course set up well but instruments can be adjusted that way but it's the way it responds, the way it fits your inner sense of tone and beauty, if it allows you to express what you want to express. If, if I feel like I'm fighting with an instrument too much, then I have a problem with it. Of course, I do fight with all my instruments, a little bit. They're, none of them is perfect. Like, there'd be, like, I wish the first string on this one was a little sweeter. So I have to, every time I play it, I got to just be careful not to make that you know, first string be strident compared to the others. But right now, I mean, I have, um, you know, a bunch of David Daly guitars. You know, we have a long relationship, and he's a real artistic maker. I like his guitars very much. Most of my recordings are on Daly's or Celine's. I still have a couple of Eric Celine's, <coughs> also very fine instruments. Uh, and all these instruments are different from each other. Same makers, perhaps, but they're uh, it's just shocking how different they are to, to me in a way. Spruces, cedars, redwoods, you know. Yeah, And then do you find that you, you place... Some of your the some of the pieces that you wrote easier on on particular guitars or, well, not easier to play necessarily, but just uh, they sound better, you know, to me. Like they, this piece, though I I can sometimes I just recorded a piece and I did it on two different guitars. I did it totally on a spruce, and then I didn't like the way it sounded, but it was my fault. I I took a, a approach where I was kind of. Um, I wanted to be very dynamic, but when I heard it back, it was kind of a slow, almost a piece monk-like, like a Thelonious Monk a little bit, really cool. I think, is it out? I think it is. It's called uh, Portrait Without Frame. And I, I think I was over, my concept was too pingy. It was like I was really trying to have these crescendos, but it became just, so I listened to it, I thought, no, okay, I'm going to put the spruce away, and try it again on this other cedar, and I took a, a gentler approach, and that was it. So, you know, I, actually, I've rarely recorded a piece twice like that. But that time I thought, eh, that's not good enough. I just, my concept was flawed. Uh, or at least I wasn't happy with it. And I thought, I'm going to re-record that. So I did. That was fine. But I did choose another guitar when I did that. Do these pieces sound best when on the guitar that you wrote them on? Or not necessarily? Not necessarily. You know, I in fact, I couldn't even remember which guitar I wrote some of them on. I mean, it was whatever one I had out. I mean, I have sometimes multiple guitars out in different tunings, so I don't have to, like, change tuning constantly. But right now, I mean, I, I this this is the guitar I leave out all the time. And this is interesting. This is an old daily. His earlier, it's got his original headstock, and not the, the new, it's just the old rounded one. And I've had this guitar for, I don't know, a couple decades. Now, this used to be an electric I had it outfitted with a, a trance pickup system. You know, it was it's a it's a concert classical, but I had it outfitted. It had a you know first of all there was a plug there that was a bad idea because when you're trying to sit classical style, so I had it moved there. In fact, the plug is still there, but there's no wires. I ripped out the pickup a couple of years ago, and because I realized I'm never playing this guitar and I'm never going to use it again. It never, you know, I I really dislike the sound of classicals with pickups it works way better on steel they got more tension which allows the guitar not to be uh, you know uh, damped down by the extra mass they got so much more frequencies that you can deal with with shaping the eq nylon they just sound pitiful usually when you amplify it and i i just i really dislike the sound so i I, I would use it only on tour when I was playing with like, you know, Pierre Ben Susan or these tours I did with these steel string guys that just sounded godlike with the sound they would get. So I, I could plug in and balance that. But then I realized, you know, I'm never going to do that again. I'm only going to mic from now on. I just, I don't care. Uh, I just don't want to get that sound anymore. So I ripped the pickup out and I was just, 
because I so I never played this guitar acoustically because the pickup was too heavy and it affected the sound. But it's just got this such a sweet sound, just so beautiful. It's a great guitar. So I, I use this for recording a lot. It's pretty easy to play. The action's a little bit lower than some of my other ones, so I can't bang it as much as I would some of my others. You know, because you know, it was made to you know be electric, but it is just. It's got a great sound. So this is my workhorse guitar. It's just out all the time. I can grab it any moment. And then, of course, I pick up my other concert guitars, too, and break them out and, and write on them and record on them and play them, too. But, that, yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, just as an illustration, that one just stays on the stand all the time. Yeah, that's amazing. you just demonstrated uh, what I mentioned earlier about how you could do a lot uh, with the note, how you could shape the note a lot on, on a on a nylon string yeah yeah with vibrato yeah, and, and all that it's the best i mean i think so linear now you know when i play single line it's i think much more like a violinist i think you know the way i i i, I that's my mindset kind of moving through i imagine almost violin the way they do things with little glisses not the swoopy, ugly glisses, but just beautiful connections between note, which guitarists typically don't do because of the frets. But I find when I'm doing that, that's I just love doing that and just the correct vibrato, changeable vibrato, and and variations in tone that give almost the illusion of, of dynamic changes within the line. You know, yeah, so I'm all about. I mean, tone is my main thing. I I just love tone, you know, and I think about it all the time, you know. What are the top five guitars that you've ever played? Either you well, you've owned or you you or you, or you just tried out. <laughs> well, I, my Daly's I love, so I would put him. Uh, he's in that, that premier class. I had a Daman for years. I just recently, in fact, for twenty years, I owned a Matthias Daman, which are astounding instruments. They're they're truly different, and truly loud. Like no hype loud. Like a lot of makers said, my guitar is much louder and. If they were, it was it was very little because we have such limited energy on for nylon string, low tension and all that. So you can't get something for nothing. Or you can get more volume, but you 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 sacrifice tone. Yeah, you can get like a mid ugly mid range spike, but who wants that? You know. So, but Dahman is is a genius. I mean, literally a mental genius, and he figured out how to build these instruments that kept most of the the desirable qualities of the guitar whilst definitely increasing the volume. Now there are deficits and I did get tired of my dominant. I would play it in concert and people were nuts for it because it's just so loud. It's like, it's just like bam. And it, it's got a gorgeous sound, but I always struggled with it. Now this is me, you know, because I want my counterpoint to be controllable and I want the inner voices not to die of their own accord before their time. The Daman, because it used so much energy in the pulse of the sound, didn't allow the inner voices to bloom in the same way a more traditional uh, uh, construction would do. So you're always fighting certain notes dying before their time or just responding in a way that, you know. But that's not Daman's fault. He did. He's the only one that successfully really handled the problem. He, he still made a gorgeous sounding instrument. And if you could deal with the slightly shrunken tonal range, and the the sustained characteristics that were a little shorter. A lot of guitarists have gone that route, and that's their you know the guitar they use all the time. However, I found if you're not careful, it can make you a little more monodimensional because my playing is all about three dimensionality. But a lot of players are kind of very two dimensional the way they come at you. A lot of them. But I like this kind of layering of of things. Had trouble with the dama, and I had, I could do it, but I had fight with it, so I sold it. So, but anyway, Daman is up there. He's he's just an amazing guitarist. Uh, you know, also, he is an amazing guitarist, but I mean, amazing guitar maker. Uh, Torre's guitars are some of the best guitars I've ever played in my life, bar none. I mean, I've done, I think, recordings on three different Torres for GSI, and every time the experience was just mind-blowing, like how these guitars could be so old, yet so perfect, and so fresh, and solid, and beautiful. You know, if, you know sometimes you couldn't push them too hard, but... Um, Wow, are they sweet. I mean, it was always an experience to play a tour. If you listen to Yamor, like when I'm playing on that tour as a GSI, like, man, what an instrument that, that was. Yeah, they, they, but they're out of my league. I could never afford a tour. What do they go, quarter million dollars for these things? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you could find one. If, if you could find yeah, a real one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, forget it. You know, we, we, it's like they, that's a, 
I can't spend that kind of money on a guitar. So, um, yeah. Um, and there's lots of other, you know, I've played and seen lots of other great guitars, but those, I'll stop at those three, those, because, you know, yeah. There's a lot of guitars people play I don't like, but I don't want to get into that. Like, it's just, it's a personal thing about the sound characteristics I find pleasant or annoying or, you know, and there's certain schools of guitar building that I um, find that sound difficult to listen to, but I won't go into any details about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, my friend now owns the uh, the Hauser that you played mm -hmm. on a GSI video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that that was a I I had fun I had fun playing that too. It's it's it's, it's a really nice guitar. I haven't played a Taurus yet. It's uh, I haven't come across a Taurus yet, though so I really would like to, but. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. one of the one of my uh, uh, one of my bucket list guitars. At least play one, you know. Just yeah. experience yeah. it firsthand. I've I've played a lot of copies, and I've I've generally liked what I've played. It's one of the it's one of the, I guess, guitar tones that uh, as far as classical goes, that I really like. But I'd, yeah, I wish I could play the real thing. Yeah, we well, probably could. You know, go to GSI when they have one. You know, and they they probably. You know, they probably let Perf to cast play. <laughs> well, the thing is, like, what was the saying? Out of the 100 guitars Taurus built, 500 are known to exist. <laughs> so there's... <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, okay. Sorry, it took me a moment. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> there's, a, yeah. there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, fakes floating around. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I have, uh, uh, we brought back... Um, Annie's father's old violin from Germany. This is Stradivarius. Yeah, but they all were. It, you know, it's like they, they're all, they, every everybody that built one after after that. They always put the label as Stradivarius. They're, you know, it's hilarious. Like you, you know, I call Rich Savito. I said, "Hey, I got this violin." I showed him with a camera. And he goes, "Yeah, yeah, another Stradivarius." They all they all are. You know, like, that's just hilarious. They all put these fake labels in them. It's like <laughs> thousands of those. You know. Yeah, and it, it's it's not, uh, and then the real things aren't Stradivarius. I think that Stradivari or yeah. yeah, there's various things and errors and sometimes misspellings. It's very funny. Though. <laughs> okay, yeah, but for a hot minute, I was like, wow, look at, you know. But then of course, I realized I can't be. You know? yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that which reminds me, that's also uh, Hauser is also a, a victim of that. It's like it's a Hauser, yeah, but it's, sure. it's like so somebody label, sure. label, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not Herman. It's like so another different first name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know. So anyway.